Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Legally, South Korea does not recognize the existence of its northern neighbor. Yet North Korea remains a pervasive feature of South Korean politics, both domestically and internationally. The discourse Seoul holds on Pyongyang, however, is far from homogeneous, and inconsistencies abound. In a single speech, it is not uncommon for North Koreans to be described both as brothers and as enemies. To make sense of this conundrum, we met with Dr. Sarah Son to talk about her research on South Korea's narrative on North Korea and the practical implications it has on how South Korea handles North Korean defectors. Dr. Son is a postdoctoral research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She has recently been a research fellow at the Academy of Korean Studies and the Asiatic Research Institute at Korea University in Seoul, focusing on identity and inter-Korean relations. Dr. Son earned a bachelor degree in international relations from Bond University in Australia and an MA in international studies and diplomacy from SOAS in 2005. Following a period working in British politics, she completed a PhD at SOAS in 2014, where she researched national identity and policy as related to Korean unification and the issue of North Korean defector resettlement in South Korea. Dr. Sarah Son, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me. What got you to focus your research on South Korea? Uh, somewhat by accident, I suppose. Um, I, I grew up in Australia before living in Britain, where we studied Asian languages and ended up in Japan after university. And then later on, when I went to the UK for graduate school, I, I happened to meet and marry my Korean husband. In spending time with his family and uh, learning about Korean culture and society, I became really interested in the stories and the history of Korea, which had somehow sort of I'd missed in my, uh, my formal education, which focused a lot more on the histories of Japan and China. So Korea uh, sort of had a, an interesting allure to me in terms of the stories I hadn't heard before. And so that's when I started to uh, become interested in finding out more about it. Today we are going to talk about national narratives. What are they? What does the term actually describe? Well, I guess the easiest way to describe a national narrative is a story in a way, a biography as some um, scholars have described it, which gives a nation a sense of we-ness, a shared and collective identity. And I think beyond a shared story, which might be considered as something deriving from the past, it also has important aspects in the present and also has to have, it's important that it has a future orientation as well. Uh, and by that I mean a shared national collective will have um, a shared vision for the future. They have shared ideas about where they'd like their nation to go, where they'd like it to be. And that's an important part of um, what politicians require to do in their everyday work is uh, proposing and, and planning where the nation will be in the future. Yeah, it can, it can be uh, surrounded by um, cultural elements, it can be uh, embedded in a shared history, it can be have to do with territory, it can have to do with um, the political style of the nation. Um, so it, it is very much an all-encompassing uh, narrative, but it's rarely something that people agree on. There's often a lot of debate, uh, it's, it doesn't move or change quickly, it evolves very slowly, um, and I think it's something that's always in flux and always shifting over time. In your research, you focus on South Korea's national narrative and how it relates itself towards North Korea. In a recent article, you described four contending discourses in this context. Could you maybe briefly introduce them for us? Sure. I, in doing my research, I was facing a struggle of dealing with the material which presented and framed North Korea in so many different ways. And so I, by virtue of having to do, you know, an extended study, there was a requirement that I distill them down, distill these perceptions down into, into four categories, which obviously do not describe all the ways in which South Korea if, if even you could describe a single state as having one particular view. But as, as far as South Korea identifies with North Korea, I distilled down into four. And they were positioned along a, a sort of a spectrum of positive and negative collective identification. So on the positive side, I tried to describe North Korea as the self in terms of South Korea, um, which is pretty obvious. It, it sort of encapsulates the idea of, of an important shared history, territorial unity and sovereignty over a long period of time, and also, crucially, this, this ethnic blood element to Korean identity, conflating nation with ethnicity. And that's where the term minjok is often used in both senses to describe a shared ethnicity as well as the nation. And it's been used, you know, across the decades, even to today, to provide sort of an impetus or rationale for certain policy behavior within the state. 
um, and also of course as the driving impetus behind the continuing pursuit of at least in the rhetoric of unification and then further, slightly further along was this idea of North Korea as a tainted form of the self which is the best term I could come up with I suppose to describe North Korea as still being the self very much part of the one whole of, an, of, of this imagined pan-Korean nation covering the entire peninsula but which has aspects that are less desirable, that are less sophisticated. There are problems, of course, with ideology, with the difference in ways of doing things, even down to things like language, the way that um, North Koreans use language as opposed to South Koreans, and cultural differences as a result of sort of hybridization of the two collectives over the time since um, the division. And then shifting to the negative side, I, I had to, to draw out these ideas about North Korea as an enemy other. So obviously, again, this is derived from the perception that North Korea has always been obstructive, that it started the Korean War, that it has caused constant disruption to South Korea's noble attempts to uh, unify the peninsula or to seek reconciliation. It even gets down to, uh, on the more individual level, it features in the perception sometimes of North Korean defectors themselves as spies or, or seeking to undermine the national security of the state. And then right on the, the other end of the spectrum, I had this idea about North Korea as a foreign other, as very much a foreign entity. And I think this focuses more on the sort of the regime level in the sense that North Korea is so different in its aims and ambitions from South Korea. And at the same time as South Korea is also working very hard to reshape itself, to present itself in new ways in the world, um, you know, as a developed, democratic, uh, forward thinking, contributing state to international affairs, which is just so different to the way that North Korea appears to behave and so it just solidifies this sort of psychological border between the two Koreas. In a regular speech or in a policy, does only one discourse at a time come or can different discourse emerge at the same time? I think they very much appear at the same time across different conversations, discussions, papers. I mean, you can read a, not that many would sit down and bother to read a unification white paper, but in just doing so, you see all four appear across the pages constantly. And it really depends whether, uh, what the discussion is about, whether it's an economically focused discussion, whether it's a uh, politically focused discussion, whether we're talking about North Korean refugee settlement, whether we're talking about human rights, whether we're talking about the environment, humanitarian aid, um, all of these issues inspire a different attitude towards North Korea, I suppose, depending on how that particular area of relations is broadly considered. I think this sort of inherent contestation of the discourses is very confusing for outside observers and has been for a long time in the sense that one minute, from an outside perspective anyway, North and South Korea appear on the verge of war when the next minute they're organizing family reunions, as we have seen recently. And so what I was trying to do was to provide some explanation for where this contradiction comes from, how it's manifest and why it's possible for them to coexist in the way that they do. National narratives change over time, of course. How has it changed? How was it, for example, before the Cold War? And how has it evolved since then? Yeah, as you say, that, that they do change over time. And, and we've seen a shift across the decades. Um, and and you, yeah, you rightly make the distinction between the Cold War period and the period since, where there has been a market change, not just as it coincided broadly with South Korea's process of democratization as well. And so the story we see South Korean leaders telling the people and hoping to instill in the nation is one of um, that, that served to legitimize the South Korean state as the legitimate ruler of the entire peninsula as the legitimate representative of this pan-Korean nation. Um, and alongside that, there was obviously economic policies designed to build South Korea up from virtually nothing. And the rationale behind that that was often presented was one of service to the nation, of owing this to ourselves as a nation which has been downtrodden for so long and that in order to lift ourselves up and to, to sort of win the win the war for legitimacy that we need to do this and doing it through economic means was a powerful way to do this. But that narrative has obviously shifted since democratization and it's interesting to sort of observe the trajectory from South Korea as a nation which has shown that it can do what other states do very well to now having the confidence to actually take some of its models of success and attempting to not sell, but, but I guess market them abroad. So for example, I, I was interested to see 
Uh, it might have been earlier this year that there was the National Conference on Education in South Korea and the big theme of the conference was on exporting South Korean education models abroad. So this is the, really the first time this has sort of happened and we're seeing this in different areas and it was interesting as well that during Lee myung Bak's presidency uh, he established a presidential council for nation branding which worked really hard to kind of sell Korea to the world in ways that it hadn't before and I think that's an indication of Korea's perhaps greater confidence in its narrative, in this new narrative where it's be actually become quite good at doing lots of things and it, it has something to offer the world. Domestic politics in South Korea are quite polarized, to say the least, uh, especially between left and right and regions. How do positions within the political spectrum relate to different narratives? Um, it's a really interesting question, this one, and um, I think... When you're talking about a national narrative, the literature on the question of national narratives will often emphasize that in order for it to work, for it to stick, for people to um, subscribe to it, it has to have coherence, both internally and in terms of how it's shown to the world. Korea, South Korea is obviously very ambitious and increasingly ambitious in in showing what it is to the world and in, in showing what it has to offer and, and what it represents. and in order for that to happen, that, that coherence has to persist both internally and externally. So there can't be too much difference between the way that Koreans broadly see themselves in terms of a national narrative at home with each other and the way they, they also talk about themselves, their, their narrative to the outside world. And so I think, interestingly, while the political polarization that is obviously a serious problem in terms of lots of domestic political issues, when it comes to this, the, the level of a national narrative, and of course narratives are different. You can have regional narratives, you can have city-level narratives, you can have political narratives according to which side of the political spectrum you may sit on. But when it comes to this broad national narrative, I don't really feel that this ideological polarization affects it to a significant extent. I think there is broad unity on the broad key points. And I think that was shown fairly clearly in, in terms of the contrast between conservative era unification policy from Im myung Bak's period to today and the previous progressive era of unification policy, which may obviously did differ significantly in terms of its um, the process. But the overall ideal, the whole reason behind continuing to pursue reunification remained the same. It has to do with fulfilling national destiny. It has to do with showing those who into the foreign nations that intervened and, and messed things up essentially that Korea was, is able to get it back together, is able to repair, is able to heal, is able to recover from this division which was essentially not of their making. And so when it comes to those key points that matter, there really wasn't much of a difference. Since you just touched on that subject, how are foreigners actually represented in South Korea's national narrative on North Korea? Um, it's a very interesting question and um, I mean there have been a lot of surveys done on this over time and you see one consistent trend that you see is a tendency for the older generation to be much more pro-American than the younger generation and um, indeed we've seen a rising conservatism among young people in recent years in South Korea and we've also seen you know, uh, significant anti-American protests um, throughout the 2000s and, and also a bit prior to that. But I, I've, read, I've read surveys, interestingly, which place, alternatively, the United States as a head in terms of what's called a country favorability rating, ahead of China, North Korea and Japan, which falls squarely last pretty much in, in every survey that's done. So it, it, really, it really does vary. But I think the overarching sense that I get in terms of unification policy and planning is that both Koreas, while they are at least in a token sense, interested in an external foreign role of some sort. The overarching emphasis is on the need for the two Koreas to resolve the division without outside interference. And I think that is obviously from a historical legacy of, of a sense that they wouldn't be in the position they are now if foreign intervention had not had the effect that it did. Arguably, one of the most prominent voices in the creation of today's narrative is President Park geun -hye. What position does she actually hold in the national narrative? I'm not sure that that's exactly correct in the sense that, yes, she is the president of today. Yes, her job is to contribute and to uphold and to defend and to provide a sense of security for South Koreans in their national narrative. 
um, to do so would be would would risk more political suicide really but I think that given the slow rate at which a national narrative evolves the way that it shifts even in Korea where where opinions can change pretty fast things come in and out of fashion like lightning I think that whether or not she has a place or an influence in South Korea's national narrative will really not be known for some time to come. What, what, it, it will really depend on what her legacy ends up being, and we don't yet know that. You know, there are presidents in, in South Korea's history where you look back and there'd be few youngsters really who could tell you what they did, how they contributed to the understanding of the nation today, whereas others, like Park Chang-hee, for example, obviously, whether you love him or hate him, had, had a significant and many would argue positive effect on South Korea at that time through his economic policies, though of course there were many problems with his rule. But um, I think it's a, it's really a matter of time we will see. I think a lot of people are confused by what she really stands for, particularly when it comes to issues like unification. Has her personal stance, I mean, when she was going for a presidential election, she must have given speech, taken a specific stance on the issue of North Korea. Has that stance changed yet? Can we see an evolution or is it overall just consistent, as you said? Prior to her election, she, she published an article in Foreign Affairs where she tried to uh, make her clear her stance on North Korea as one of being somewhere between engagement from the, the previous era uh, under Nam Woo Hyun and Kim Dae Jung and deterrence, which was primarily Im Young Bak's position. But at the same time, if you look at the unification publicity materials, I suppose, you don't see a great deal of difference across the years. Um, it's sort of the same kind of rationale, the same kind of vague ideas and plans. But what I think is interesting is that she's introduced this idea of what came to be called trust politic which is very much obviously about trust building. And I think she, perhaps more than her predecessor, places an emphasis on laying groundwork. And there seems to be a much more a sense, actually perhaps more similar to the progressive era, where there's one of setting the scene of, of making sure that everything happens in a gradual, secure and safe environment first, perhaps achieving uh, reconciliation ahead of any talks about unification but it's all very vague and in a, and in a sense it's very difficult for it to be any other way simply because as soon as you start being specific as soon as you start making concrete plans then you open yourself up to all kinds of debate and discussion and contestation and argument really so I don't think she's been particularly consistent or clear on anything and I think it will very much be a matter of waiting to waiting and seeing what happens towards the end of her tenure and then looking back and seeing whether we really can see any coherence. You mentioned that she refuses to open up to any specific debate. Would you say that's a general trend in Korean politics, pushing forward debates about what to do uh, in practice about North Korea in, in a way staying safe, let's say, feeling safe because it's not a problem that is immediate? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is how it is and how it has to be. There's no way to get away from that. And I think as as time continues to pass and as unification becomes a bigger and more daunting task as it becomes more expensive as the difference basically opens up as the amount that has to be repaired and dealt with becomes greater with time that's assuming of course that North Korea doesn't improve particularly economically in any significant way in the coming years that it just becomes a bigger and bigger task um, and obviously has a lot to do with the national will to unify which is where unification policy has come to focus on increasingly in recent years is educating South Koreans about the need for unification, of holding all kinds of educational activities in school curriculums with adults, with teenagers, with university students, trying to promote unification, which is something that wasn't necessary in the past. But that's obviously indicative of the fact that general sentiment is shifting in the opposite direction and that the Ministry of Unification is, is working very hard to combat that and to try and continue to promote unification as something which is necessary, which is kind of ironic, given that they are also, un, as a democratically elected government, they are supposed to be following the will of the people. So, yeah, it's a very uh, difficult question. A year ago, President Park Geun-hye talked of reunification as Dongil Tebak, which has been, well, roughly translated as reunification bonanza. Does that take part in the same narrative of trying to motivate people and saying that maybe it might be hard, but reunification is not that bad at the end of the day? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Ministry of Unification puts puts a lot of money into uh, various academic institutes and universities, into think tanks and NGOs, and the result is that these organizations and these academic institutes are motivated to generate lots of economic cost benefit analysis of what unification would cost and 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 just how better off a united korea would be over and above staying divided and of course with the huge reduction in military spending that would result from a unification scenario with north korean manpower with its resources with manufacturing output it can technically make great economic sense if you're looking at it in that way and i think that's what dong il teba was playing to to some extent But on the other hand, I think what it neglects, and which is a great concern that came out of my own research, I felt was, was that it glosses over the social and political problems, which can end up being incredibly costly, which can uh, hamper and provide a significant handicap to the ability to recover economically and to introduce the necessary economic reforms. And we cannot underestimate just how powerful those those socio-political forces can be in undermining progress in other areas. And we've seen that across the world, particularly since the end of the Cold War, where, you know, intrastate violence, conflict, rioting can just cause all kinds of trouble. And it's not featuring in the calculations that have emerged so far. Today, would the Korean people actually subscribe to a narrative that emphasizes the good of reunification? Do they subscribe to that or do they just listen to it and then forget immediately? Well, that's a good, it's a good question because it's one of the reasons why I'm not particularly convinced by opinion polls on unification that you often see coming out of the government um, and out of um, university institutions is because they'll ask the broad question, you know, is reunification necessary? And in theory, many will say yes. But if you were to ask them anything specific, so, you know, if unification were to happen next week, would you be in favor of it? I think when it becomes more immediate, when it becomes more personal, you end up with a whole other set of opinions. Um, if, when, if you were to lay out to, you know, South Korean respondents, you know, this is what unification will cost you as an individual. When we work out all of the cost, the taxation required, the investment that your household would end up needing to contribute ultimately, do you think that you should be paying for this? Many will say no. And so I think we have to be careful about taking a lot of the survey and opinion poll data that comes out at face value. And, and I, think, I think a lot of those who are doing surveys are getting better at asking more specific questions that help to um, give evidence of more specific opinions on different aspects of unification. But I think when you ask the broad question in theory, you know, it would be a wonderful thing. It would be great. It would be great for North Korea, for the North Korean people. It would be, you know, fulfilling the, the destiny of this state, which was, you know, separated against its will. But when it comes to the specifics, it's a whole other game. Would you say it's a fair assessment to say that the government is pushing more for the second discourse you talked about, North Korea is a tainted self, it's our self but not quite the same, but redeemable, and on the other hand, the public it seems to be more adopting the third discourse you talked about, which is North Korea as a foreign. Yes, I, th I think that's pretty much accurate. I think you hit it spot on there. I think that it's in the interests of... Again, I have to stress that I don't think that there is by any means unity across the South Korean government in terms of what they, how they feel about unification and whether the Ministry of Unification is representative of the view of other arms of government. And I know there has been contest between them as well about how to deal with certain aspects of unification policy, particularly North Korean defector settlement. But I think that, yes, it's in the interest of the government to promote this tainted self-discourse. It works really well because it acknowledges the problems, but it promises that with time, uh, through the power of ethnic unity, through the power of destiny and history, these can be overcome. And if everyone just pulls together and, and harnesses this will to unify, then everything will be fine. And, and that's the function I think it serves. Whereas by default, the foreign other discourse element of the narrative, I think is simply how things are falling. It's how the chips are falling really when it comes to day-to-day -day life. North Koreans live on the other side of a border. They live under a completely different system. They have completely different cultural behaviors now than at the time when they were unified. While there are still many, many commonalities, Sometimes those differences just seem overwhelming. Recently, the PAC administration has announced that in the near future, schools will have to rely on a single government-authored textbook 
to teach history in the higher classes. As the argument goes, some of the current textbooks are much too left-leaning when it comes to North Korea and should be replaced by something that will teach the right vision of history. What do you make of that? I find it disappointing. I'm aware that I think the history textbooks in South Korea were government-mandated textbooks until about 2009. So it's only more recently that they've liberalized and allowed alternative versions to be chosen by schools. And so the fact that we are now seeing a back step after only a few years is, is disappointing and it's not really in line with what's obviously been going on for a long time in, in other developed nations. But I think perhaps it's also a sign of the ongoing insecurity about the national narrative that exists in South Korea and among its policymakers, that they are concerned that the story that South Koreans are being told and adopting and subscribing to is not the right one. But at the same time, you know, to the idea that a single elected government would be able to describe the truth is is bordering on ridiculous. And, you know, they're, they're rightfully so. There have been protests. Uh, there's even a group of Korean studies professors all over the world who've signed an open letter to the government in protest to this. And, um, yeah, I just think there is a problem when you have power determining the truth and where you have this, this sort of truth being decided by the winners. And I, I don't think that's right. And I think that perhaps more importantly, what it also highlights is it is perhaps, I don't know this for sure, my impression is that alongside the teaching of history needs to be a teaching of an attitude of inquiry, an attitude of debate, an attitude of bringing together different historical views and debating them and allowing for difference of opinion because that's what history is. It's not a single set of facts. If it was, if we'd only stuck to the truth, it would only last a few pages because there is so little that we really know for sure in terms of the facts of things that occur. So I find it sad and you know, I don't think that there will ever be agreement, but I think I'd rather see disagreement among the different views that appear within the history textbooks than one single government-sanctioned view on North Korea and its people. Over the past years, more and more defectors have made their way from North Korea to South Korea. How do they fit into this South Korean narrative on North Korea? Um, they fit, I guess, in, in different ways. Um, Obviously, in, in, I guess in an abstract sense, in a, in, a, in a sort of removed sense, they are considered brethren, they are part of this pan-Korean national identity, they are very significant to the reclaiming of the one Korea that was lost. And so on that basis, of course, they are granted citizenship automatically and they are, there is no question about them being allowed to be here and that they are welcome here. But in reality... Of course, there are problems in, in terms of the degree to which they exhibit difference and they uh, perhaps present a little bit of a, a threat to what is a very otherwise a very homogenous cultural society. And so they are a difficult group for, I think, the South Korean national narrative to come to terms with, and increasingly so as their numbers have grown over time. How does the government look upon and treat them, both in terms of the narrative it adheres to but also in their de facto treatment of the North Korean defectors? Um, I think it's important to be a little sympathetic towards the government and its various bodies that are responsible for uh, North Korean defectors in the sense that I don't question the fact that they have always tried to do their best for North Korean defectors or refugees coming to live here. However, whether best is good enough, whether it's sufficient, whether it does the job is a whole other question, and I don't think it necessarily does. And that's due to a range of factors. I think, at least until quite recently, the biggest reason behind that was the simple fact that no one expected the numbers to leave that ultimately did during and after the North Korean famine in the mid to late 90s and, and after that through chain migration, through, you know, various increases in border crossings to China and, and the sort of establishment of routes for escape through brokers and whatnot. And so the government was always playing catch up, always, uh, you know, it built Hanawon in, I think it was 1999 that Hanawon opened, the Hanawon Resettlement Center. And yet the numbers quickly outgrew that. They had to shorten the resettlement program in order to make enough room for the next lot to come in. And then they built a second Hana one, which I think opened in 2013, uh, early, it might be December 2012 or early 2013. 
But interestingly, since that time, the numbers have dipped slightly and so suddenly there's not as much need for it as there was. Um, so I think it's always been trying to, to do its best and, and working alongside NGOs and actually increasingly outsourcing its activities to NGOs to make sure, well, I guess sensing that the NGOs have often got better at looking after North Koreans than the actual central government has. Um, and so it's kind of just been on this very steep learning curve, but always slightly behind the ball. And so, and also been trying to do things on the assumption that assimilation for North Korean defectors will be automatic and very straightforward, which it has, and it has been anything but that for many, many defectors. Let's say I'm a North Korean defector. I just arrived in Seoul, somehow. What are the steps that I will be going through as a defector? It has changed over time. As far as I know, there is the mandatory period of interrogation where they are kept in a secure um, location at Hanawon, I think, to ensure that they are uh, legitimate claimants to being North Korean defectors um, because there have been cases of Korean Chinese uh, attempting to pass themselves off as North Korean defectors. Um, and also, of course, there have been North Korean spies who've attempted to enter and have entered successfully via that route. And then there are various types of training, which again have evolved over time. The, the programs have changed from being all in-house to being opening up separate schooling for North Korean defectors especially, rather than having them integrate specifically through normal South Korean schools. And then once they are, they are released from Hanawon, they are settled in a location. And they can choose where they go to some extent, I think. There are incentives to go to rural areas or places where there, there is more administrative capacity to take care of them. And then there are HANA centers in different parts of the country, which are more like day centers where they can go for secondary training in certain skills. You know, they can receive English training, they can get work and all these, these sort of sorts of things to help them integrate along the way. So it's really a process. And I think it really depends where they go. There are different regions which do things slightly differently. And there are different opportunities available then to them as well to kind of help determine their own future and what they think they might like to do moving forward. So assimilation is the purpose of those programs. Is it successful? And if not, what are the problems encountered most frequently? Yeah, ass assimilation has proven a problem, particularly for older arrivals. Those who are older obviously have more established behaviors. It's harder for them to, you know, pass themselves off as a South Korean, which is what they often feel they're being asked to do. I think for younger, for, for kids um, who have the opportunity to go to school, uh, to go to university, to, to, to dress in the fashion of the day, to adopt a South Korean accent more quickly, it's much easier to assimilate. But I'm not sure that they're happy with that necessarily. And I think that their North Koreanness, once it's known, will always follow them around. It will always be attached to them because I think, like, not just South Korea, but most societies do like to put people in categories. And once you're in a category and everyone knows about it, it's hard to get out of it. And so this need and requirement that they, I think the way it's described in the in the Ministry of Unification Literature is, is sort of successfully integrate or fully integrate. I'm not sure what that means, but the general assumption is that it's one of assimilation. But I think that there is increasingly the government is beginning to realize that this doesn't work and therefore there is a need for a, a certain degree of of compassion and education given to society as well as to how to look after accept and take care of this this group of people who are in need has the government's policy towards defectors evolved over time do we see an evolution that mirrors government speeches government discourses on north korea in general I think that the two are often quite distinct. I mean, we see inter-Korean relations, you know, cycling through periods of conflict and then reconciliation all the time. But I think, you know, the, both the government and the general public are generally able to separate North, the North Korean defector population from that same sort of cycle. Although I re recall reading about or hearing about how after Lee Myung-bak became president, that certain North Korean defector groups who were making a living doing things like um, musical performances were finding a decline in bookings that were finding it harder to get work um, and that often if there was a particularly nasty period of, of inter-Korean relations that North Korean defectors did feel sometimes like the frustration and anger over that was taken out on them. But generally the policy framework for North Korean defectors is very much, I think, evolved more according to their immediate needs and also the need of the state and its best interests. So this has meant 
an increasing focus in recent years on um, helping them to become independent, weaning them off welfare, ensuring that they adapt as quickly as possible and find their own way so that they are no longer dependent on state handouts. So, you know, whereas the first defectors who, you know, would fly fighter aircraft across the border, they would be on television, they would receive millions of US dollars in reward money and live a very comfortable existence afterwards. Uh, you know, we're very different from a North Korea coming today where the, the lump sum payment at, in the initial stages is very small. Instead, they're given housing support, they're given um, educational training, they're given uh, volunteer internship opportunities, this kind of thing. Um, and it's much more geared towards, I read one uh, minister, or he might have been, I think it was the head of the Korea Hana Foundation, said something like, um, you know, it's all very well to give them bread, but it's much better that we teach them how to make bread. Not all defectors are necessarily poor, and that must be quite hard for those who feel that their status, their social recognition, has totally disappeared. They are no one all of a sudden. I, I think it must be. I mean, I cannot speak for the, the defective population by any means, but I think that's evident in the fact that I've heard reports of often North Korean defector men really struggling to adjust to life here, whereby sometimes their wives are more successful in getting part-time work than they are, where you know they're living in a society which culturally has evolved from the man as kind of the king of the family, whereby gender relations are different here, and they can't quite cope with that. You know, they find it difficult to adjust to gender roles that are slightly different from the North Korea they came from. Um, and so all of those things are, are a real struggle but you do often see certain defectors who've done really well establishing themselves in South Korean society in different ways. You see, you know, obviously those who, who've done well in academia, who've come to open businesses, who uh, are on television, um, and who've become a real kind of pillar of success for their community. And the government actually, you know, does work hard to, to position those people as role models for the rest of the defector community. But it's it's not easy and it's not always going to be possible for an individual to reclaim the status they felt they had in their former life. You mentioned earlier that the position of the government on refugees has changed in the way they support refugees. What about the public? Has their opinion of North Korean defectors changed over time as well? I think the interesting thing to point out on, on those sorts of questions is that there are still less than 30,000 of them. There are more than 1.5 million foreigners of other origin in South Korea. And so the chances of an individual South Korean having had any sort of extended counter with a North Korean and knowing about it is really, really small. And there is a big difference between how one feels about a North Korean one knows personally and how one feels about North Koreans in general that they might have read about in the paper. So an issue that is very small can be made very big by extensive media coverage and it can have a huge influence over opinion. And so when there were periods of North Koreans being found to be spying in South Korea, I'm sure at that time if you had surveyed the general public they would have been very suspicious, very concerned about national security, you know, all of these issues. But then when it comes to day-to-day -day life, I don't think there is a particularly strong opinion about who North Korean defectors are. The numbers are still small. Again, I think perhaps if there was a sudden influx, a much bigger influx that was beginning to be felt palpably by the general population, whether by through media coverage, whether by through actually their physical presence, much greater physical presence in society, you would begin to feel, you know, a real sense of concern and a threat to general social cohesion, social um, security, I suppose, societal security in some senses. And, and in that case, it may be very different. But as it stands now, I think day to day, South Koreans have so much else to worry about and are so preoccupied with so much else that I think it's difficult to really gauge a particular opinion one way or the other. Would you say that South Koreans have a tendency now to consider North Koreans rather as foreigners, just one more foreigner among so many others foreigners, rather than as brothers, as previous generation might have felt? It's a an interesting question in the sense that I think, again, it's one of those questions where, you know, if you're talking and asking someone in abstract terms, they would see North Koreans as perhaps brethren in an ethnic sense to whom the nation, the state owes a responsibility in the interests of upholding what remains of the idea of a pan-Korean nation. 
But interestingly, we've seen a shift in in recent years towards in the inclusion of North Korean defectors in multiculturalism policy in South Korea, not overtly, but to the extent that North Koreans are have been included in television programs on multicultural families, for example. Uh, they've been invited to the same celebrations together uh, that celebrate multicultural families in South Korea. And North Koreans don't like it. There's been a, broadly speaking, there's, there's been a, a sort of a, a rebellion against this inclusion where North Koreans defectors have reported feeling like to do that is to deny their special status, their superior status in the, in the hierarchy of immigrants to South Korea, which definitely exists. We know that there is a, a sort of hierarchy of, of foreigners in South Korea um, to some extent. And so they see themselves as above that, as deserving of, of distinct and different recognition. Um, and so that has been, I think, as a result of the tendency for policy for North Korean refugees at the grassroots level looking pretty much the same as the necessary policies for multicultural families or, or other immigrants to South Korea. And that when you're having to budget at a local authority level for these types of programs, it's easy just to put them together, right? Rather than having to duplicate them for different groups because they want to feel special, you know? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a question which again varies. And this is why these discourses are in constant coexistence, but also contestation in the minds of those who are talking about and dealing with North Korean settled here. So North Korean defectors living in South Korea consider themselves to be above other groups of foreigners, uh, especially migrants. But what about Koreans? How do they consider North Koreans? Are they hierarchized in a lower category than the average Korean? Or is it more on a one-to-one basis? I don't think I recall reading any statistics on that. I think it's because it's not a politically correct correct question to ask. I think it's perhaps possibly a bit embarrassing. And I don't think it's a question the Minister of Unification would want to ask because it might make them end up looking bad or the, the South Korean people end up looking bad. But I think it's something that is, is sort of manifest in the sense that that both North and South Koreans get of each other's relative position within society. So, you know, I think North Koreans, you know, want recognition for the unique position that they've come from in the sense that they've had to do something extremely brave, extremely traumatic, extremely difficult in order to get here, and that their status is as part of an important and significant Korean nation, which may not be in existence in a physical form, but at a psychological level, it has great importance, and and that this matters and should matter. And, you know, it's tied to North Koreans equally having a strong historically a strong education with emphasis on the purity of Korean blood. And so, um, you know, this, that's something you can't just educate out of someone immediately, you know. And, and this, this importance of blood is affirmed by South Koreans equally often. It's something which still has a long way to go if it's ever to be changed. Um, and so with this constant, with this background of affirmation of the importance of that ethnic oneness, there's always going to be a sense that North Koreans want to claim that, but at the same time, there is a hierarchy within it. Um, and, and I would refer to um, Shin Gyuk, who's written, he calls it the black sheep effect, and he's written on that very well. It's got to do with in-group, out-group differences. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. As you mentioned, there is this idea that North Koreans are the same as us, as in Korea in this case, but it's surprising to see how little both the government and the public seem to care about North Korean human rights. A lot of refugees come because they are oppressed, but once they get here, it doesn't seem like the public actually cares that much about their lives when they were in North Korea. Yes, I think that's true um, to a significant extent, but I think that has to do a lot with South Korea's degree of maturity as a democratic society. And I think, you know, South Korea had its own human rights problems for a long time, and many would argue it still does in terms of the continuing um, presence of the um, national security law. And so, you know, there are certain things you cannot say publicly in South Korea without risking criminal prosecution, especially regarding North Korea. And so it's a constant battle for non-governmental organizations to get funding, separate from the government and to raise awareness of human rights issues and again I think people often feel that they have so much else to worry about still there have been setbacks like the Asian financial crisis which again these were all 
reasons to hunker down, to look at look internally, to to focus on getting ourselves back to where we need to be in order to to function well, to be the state we want to be. That perhaps society hasn't matured to the extent that it's now ready to be concerned and worried about human rights beyond its borders. And I mean, one of the biggest indicators of that is that its acceptance of refugees from origins other than North Korea is minuscule by comparison. It, I think it's in the hundreds, honestly. It's less than a thousand, I think, each year. That may have changed in the last couple of years, I'm not sure, but there are only a tiny number that they allow in. And so I just don't think it's quite reached that that level of, of concern. It's not on the radar. That's not to say that it isn't a feature of the government rhetoric, however. I mean, the white papers of recent years are are peppered with references to human rights and humanitarian concern. But I think that's, again, more at the rhetorical level. It's a matter of what some international relations theorists describe as trying on certain identity norms. You try them on in the beginning, you talk about them, and then eventually through that process, the vague intention is that those norms will become a practical reality within that state. And sometimes they do, often they do, sometimes they don't. But it's part of a state's shoring up its own security in the wider world and where it wants to see itself position. In conclusion, we've discussed South Korea's narrative on North Korea, but this is not the only source of identity formation. There are a lot more global and external factors coming into play. How do you see identity narratives in South Korea evolve in light of its global ambitions, and especially with regards to unification? I think that perhaps if South Korea continues along its current trajectory, I don't think it's going to be possible for South Korea to continue to have its cake and eat it, in the sense that I don't think it's possible for South Korea to have a a strong economy, a cohesive society, you know, a robust democracy, uh, which it's still working towards, and a good reputation on the international stage, while at the same time pursuing this unification ideal in terms of how North Korea stands at present, simply because of the cost that would be involved of the huge sacrifice that would have to be made on the part of South Korea in order to facilitate that eventuality. And so this kind of disjuncture between the possible reality and the reality that South Korea is currently chasing is a real problem. And I think that as yet, the idea of never unifying with North Korea remains very much a dystopic vision. It's too much of a dystopia. It's something which may take another generation for people to even to begin to let go of. I'm not saying that unification shouldn't happen or that it's not desirable, but I think that In order to add a sense of cohesion to South Korea's national narrative, at some point, it may have to come to terms with the possibility that, at least in the initial stages, peaceful reconciliation with North Korea is a desirable goal, is a more desirable goal. If unification results from that ultimately, then, then great. But I think it has to happen because it's what everybody wants. It's what what fits with the narrative of the nation, not just of South Korea, but of the entire peninsula. It has to fit. If it's forced there will be no end of strife. And I really think that that's going to have to be something that the policymakers of this country, as they continue to operate often in a quite a paternalistic manner, will need to come to terms with at some point, rather than glossing over, ignoring and being vague about indefinitely. Um, And I, I do hope that perhaps some discussion of alternative ways of achieving peace, as opposed to necessarily unification, does enter the discourses officially at some point in the future. Dr. Sarah Son. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.